So the, that was magical, and the print was good, Fred. <laughs> it comes, it comes. We have to, we have to thank the the, the Library of Congress for it. You know, there are not many uh, of these thirty fives left, so we are very grateful that we could borrow it. Oh, it worked. Yes. It works. So, just a, a basic question: How did you two uh, uh, became involved with 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 the making of the, of this film? Um, in my involvement started in 1984 at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, we were in Cannes with a film that I had produced, Paris, Texas, and John Houston was in Cannes with a film that my partner had produced, Under the Volcano. And uh, after the festival, Wieland, my partner, invited me to meet with John Houston, and we had a wonderful lunch drinking quite a bit, and we were talking about who had the best idea for the most unlikely film to be made. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, John, the gambler, knew he had the chips. So you know, he said, what about a film, a short story by James Joyce called The Dead that is 66 pages long, and the largest piece of action in this story is the breaking of the goose, uh, the goose bone. The <laughs> and uh, it was quite an interesting discussion. He talked about how he has read this story when he was very young, and he was very impressed by it. And it, it had never left him. He just was never able to even ask anybody to make this story into a film. And so we left it at that, and then a few months later, Wieland, my partner, and I, we talked about it. We, we read the story, and, uh, and uh, we called John, and he was in London working on a film with his son. And then we said, can we talk about this story? And he said, you are joking. I said, no, no. I said, so we went to London. We sat down with him, and we explained to him why we were interested in making this film, why we thought we could make this film. And uh, he listened to us, and uh, it was a very short meeting, like 15 minutes. And then he said, OK, boys, uh, let's do this. You will find the money, and I will make the movie. <laughs> and is there anything else I can do for you? <laughs> and then he kind of, you know, kind of said, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> and that was it. And the next day, he called his son, Tony. Tony came to London. They started to work on the screenplay, and Vila, my partner, and I, we sat there and said, man, what do we do now? <laughs> I mean, we gave, we gave our word. Anyway, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, the beginning of this film. And uh, Fred came on board. Uh, we had worked together on, on a film called The State of Things with Vin Vendors. Chris produced several of Vin Vendors' films. Yes. And uh, like five of them or so. And uh, that's how we knew Fred. And uh, when, the, when we came to the point of casting the film and hiring the crew, um, uh, John wanted, wanted us to show him films of cinematographers that we had worked with. He didn't want to hire anybody that we did not know. And uh, so we introduced Fred. And he looked at a few other cinematographers' films. and. And he said, Fred, it is. So that's how Fred shot this film. <laughs> you know, the, the one thing that it, to me is hard to believe is that the film was actually, you know, Houston was, was too ill to travel. He couldn't travel. So the film is shot in California in a warehouse, you know. And you feel you're in Ireland. You feel the cold. <clears throat> you feel the snow. You know, the snow is plastic. And so f Fred, how uh, you and Houston created this world and how did you lit it? What were the, what were the conversation you were having on, on how, to, how to make this film feel this way? Um, the thing about John is that um, he never told you anything. <laughs> he simply expected you to figure it out. And uh, if he didn't figure it out, he would be very upset. Uh, and I kept badgering him. I said, what, you know, what, what do you want this to look like? And at one point, he got tired of being badgered. And he said, uh, Fred, uh, 
I'd like it to look like those kind of uh, classical 19th century paintings. You know the kind. <laughs> I thought, yeah, of course. <laughs> so finally I, I dragged him to, I said, well, maybe we should look at a movie. So I dragged him to the movies, and uh, we saw. I dragged him to Fanny and Al Fanny and Alexander, which I thought would be the kind of movie that he might that would give us some some basis of talking, and that really worked. And that was one of those amazing sort of Hollywood things where this is not this is pre digital, obviously. So he called up some studio, and they said, okay, and we went over there, probably Fox, I don't really remember, and we sat in just the two of us in a gigantic screening room, and we're shown Fanny Alexander, which is obviously the past, but, um, and the other, the other sort of way that we found the look was the production designer did a series of drawings and watercolors. And he was another person who was very interesting. He spoke only in whispers. <laughs> and you could barely hear him. And you would have to say, Fred, Fred, it's about this. So, so that, that was interesting. But he did mm, how many? Seven or eight or 10, maybe 12 illustrations that actually we copied. I mean, when we went to Ireland, the shot where the camera's up in the air and the carriage goes underneath, and the carriage goes over the bridge, and the carriage is leaving, I think that's Dublin, that's uh, the college, Dublin College. All those shots were actually watercolors that he did long before we started the movie. And did, did a few others that were um, the interiors and sort of the color, the idea of the color. And obviously, you know, I got the idea that um, the idea of juxtaposing warm and cold. So the whole movie was mostly lit by very warm lights, very soft, very warm lights that were always pushing, that were sort of, I guess, influenced by candlelight, but but more just my thought that it should be warm light juxtaposed with the cold light you see in the windows and around the edges of the frame. And sometimes people were filled with cooler light, so there would be a, a kind of contrast. And, and the, 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 you went to Ireland afterwards to, yes. to, to film yes. the, you know, the, 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 the exterior. It's just so. Chris and myself. John, John couldn't come. They, his doctor wouldn't let him, as I recall. Is that? Well, yeah, he couldn't, he couldn't travel because of his emphysema condition. And yeah. I mean, he was dying while he was making this film, so travel was out of the question. Yeah. And um, th there is something, uh, as, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, incredibly intimate about you know uh, the, the, the set, and and I'm wondering how did he, but there is such a precision of you know of the cuts and of the the actors' work. I'm wondering was it extremely rehearsed, and and how do you design the shots to make it so uh, uh, perfect? <laughs> well. Actually, I was watching it tonight, um, I was trying to re think, how on earth did we do that? Um, no, truly. Uh, well, the way I, I think it was just the lucky coincidence of John, his taste, and perhaps my taste, as far as shots and the way shots developed. I think it's just simply that lucky coincidence. I have no, I mean, in a way, the material drives what you're going to do. And in a way, you often don't, you think you're thinking about it, and you think you're figuring it all out. But truth is, when you're actually doing it, that's when those decisions are really made. So how does the camera, why is the camera moving there following, you know, that? So John would this is the way it sort of worked. Um, Tommy Shaw, who was the assistant director, and John's old assistant director did many, many movies with him. Um, Tommy, John would tell us, I've, I'd like the camera to start here. 
and then cross the room and find a clo go to a close up of Chris. And uh, I'll see you boys later. <laughs> so, so Tommy and I would set this up, and we would figure out the lens and you know, decide you know, the camera should cross and pan and move, and how, how would we do that? And then we'd get, we'd get the actors. They'd be dressed, et cetera, and we'd rehearse. And then John would come, and we'd show it to him, and he would tell us whether he liked it or not. Most of the time, he did. And sometimes he said, no, boys, too arty. Let's do something else. So, but it was, so in a way, it's, I was thinking when I saw, actually, all these shots often work together brilliantly. I'm really surprised. Tonight, watching it again, and I haven't seen it in a large format in forever, um, I'm surprised and shocked how well it worked. Well, and uh, there is another point. Uh, it was really interesting uh, to watch John direct. He had almost every shot in his head. Uh, there was an economy of shooting, an economy of working with this very complicated and very difficult material that was just astonishing. And uh, he insisted that the first shot was almost always the best shot until Fred said he wanted another shot. And John said, Freddie, why would we want another shot? You know, this was, this was fine. And then we had to come in and say, well, we need another shot for, for uh, uh, this and that reason. But, um, you know, coming from the kind of auteur film area, German auteur film of the late 70s and early 80s, where a lot of improvisation uh, is a lot of improv improvisation is required to to make a film. The directors don't really have a lot of time to complete idea in this film. And with John, it was like totally clear what he wanted. There was never a question about it, and uh, he only shot the material that he needed for a particular scene. So he did a shot, a wide shot. And instead of shooting the whole dialogue from this angle and shooting it from that angle, he just shot the piece of dialogue that he really needed. And uh, when we watched our rushes every day, we had like two minutes or three minutes or five minutes of rushes, and that was it. And four weeks after we finished shooting the film, we had pretty much an almost final cut of the film. Uh, and this was just uh, an amazing, uh, an amazing feat, and was amazing to watch for us what directing can really be like. Yeah, he also uh, John was sort of of the, for the most part, except for the the scene around the dinner table. The idea was that m one shot leads you to the next shot. There's not a lot of cross cutting. There's not a lot of going back. There's not a lot of reverses. It's just one shot simply takes you to the next shot. You cut, you're in the, you reverse on that, and you're in the next shot, and that leads you maybe to the next shot, and so on and so on. When you get into a dining room, of course, it's a different problem. But There, there is a gentleness to, to this film that is not usually instinctively associated to Houston's work. You know, if you think of, of his films as Treasure of Sierra Madre, Night of the Iguana, Under the Volcano, Moby Dick, I mean, they're muscular, uh, you know, films. And, and this is, has a, this sort of per, soft precision and, and, and effortless. That's why I read the Kale line, because it feels like it's coming almost intuitively. It's not, it's not a filter anymore. It just comes. I, I believe it had to do with the fact that he sat on the story for so long that it moved him almost all his life, and he was known as a director for kind of more masculine characters in films. And he, he, he probably never really went out and dared to ask anybody to turn this story into a film until Wieland, my partner, and I, we came along, and you know we were young, and hey, let's do this. Why not? That's a great story, wonderful, you know? The reason why he wanted to make the film was probably a different reason. Um, I mean, he was at the end of his life. He, he was very ill, um, but he was totally on top of 
his of his directing. Obviously, yeah. It was it was just amazing to watch, and you know, every morning we had a production meet, so called production meeting with him, and uh, he was concerned about the length of the film. Now, the script was only seventy five pages long, and we had to deliver a film of 85 minutes and we always begged him, John, you have to do something, you know, it's too short, it's only 60 minutes now, it's 65, it's 70. And uh, so he teased us and he says, well, every morning, boys, I found another page that I think we can cut and oh no, you know, <laughs> don't do this to us, you know. And, um, and then he kind of laughed and he said, well, boys, don't worry, don't worry, I will finish this film, I will deliver you a complete film. Which it did. So it um, also in terms of the whole production environment and the production atmosphere, there was no drama. It was like incredibly relaxed. Uh, we shot like from eight or nine in the morning until four or five, five o'clock. We had rushes, um, and most of the most of the shooting was done in Valencia, outside of Los Angeles, in a uh, in one of these pop-up factory halls, and. Uh, Six weeks, and we shot this film. There is there is a, a lovely documentary that Lillian Suvernik made, uh, which is called John Huston, the Dubliner, and it's really uh, if if you have a chance, see it because it's it's really gives you a chance to see the uh, the, uh, the the you know the calm of the set and the the you know this self assurance and this, the the. The, just the demeanor of uh, Houston with the actors is really interesting. And he's, as they're saying, you know, he was only imparting very small suggestion. He wasn't like, you have to do this, this. It's just a little thing here, a little thing there. It's it's very uh, interesting, especially for his work with, uh, with the actors. It's a lovely piece. And uh, uh, Houston was known for literary adaptations, but he said, I think, uh, that he had a particular strong bond with Joyce like, that had started with Ulysses when he was very young. Do you know much uh, about uh, you know much about his relationship with Joyce or um, I mean with his work obviously. He did not discuss Joyce very much you know he they said he was very sparse and uh, as I said our product our first meeting when we said yes John we will raise some money to make this film if you want to direct it and this was 10 minutes or 15 minutes you know we didn't go into James Joyce and the stories and when he read this book and how he felt no he said mm, guys you raised some money and I will direct the movie that's it anything else you know and that's the way he handled all of us during the production he just he just took the position that he, as a director, had chosen everybody who worked on the film. And if somebody wasn't able to do his job right, then he had the mistake of hiring the wrong person. And so everybody who was hired was really at the top of, at the top of their game, and there was no pressure whatsoever, except that John Huston was directing this film. And a lot of us were nervous the first few days. But. Um, yes. That was it. That's for sure. Raise your hand if you if you have a question. Oh, there is there is one one here. No, hold on hold on for the microphone so we hear you. Uh, you said in your in your first meeting he said boys go raise the money and we'll do the film. How much did this film cost? Um, thirty five years ago. <laughs> so thirty five years ago, I think it was like five or six million dollars. About five and a half million dollars. That was a lot. Then. At the time, it was well, yeah. Mm. It wasn't a lot, no. But was it difficult to 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 convince people that the that, that you know this this short story could be adapted? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, difficult is an understatement. Um, mm. uh, when we talked to John, we're going out now and raise some money after he had written the first draft or first to draft of the screenplays, um, he said, I have all these friends in Hollywood. And John was friends with everybody in Hollywood, like the stu heads of studios and big producers and small producers, uh, very wealthy people. And everybody had told him, like the years, in the last few years before he started to work on this film, John, anything you need, if you ever need anything, if you ever want to make another film, Give me a call. We'll be there for you. I'll be there for you. I'll help you. You know, whatever it is. So he gave us this list and the names. And the numbers. And he said, oh, well, good luck, boys. 
And then we landed my partner and I. We were in Los Angeles, had a stack of screenplays in the back of the car, and we were making the tour of Hollywood of all the studios and big producers and trying to raise money for this film. And uh, the end result was like a zero. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, we, we couldn't even get like a lamp or a camera or from a studio a, a stage space to, uh, to set up this film. So that kicked us right back to Europe. And uh, I had a, a film distribution company in Germany at the time. So, um, we, you know, we did the initial funding and then. Um, there was a new video company that opened up shop on the East Coast called Vestron. And uh, a, uh, Bill Quickly was a guy who ran the production side of Vestron Video. And uh, he had studied uh, English and Irish literature in Ireland. And when he read the screenplay, he totally flipped out. And he said, I have to make this film. I know my boss will hate me. He just hired me. <laughs> I'll go to him and I tell him, either I can make this film, either you give me the money for the production of this film or I quit my job. And he did, you know, and he went in. And uh, so we got a substantial amount of money from, from Vestron Video, a video company. And uh, then I got uh, Channel 4 involved. And then at the tail end, when the last whatever, it's always the last million dollars or whatever is missing, um, I got another British television company that uh, needed a huge tax write-off and restructured some kind of... Anyway, it's totally uninteresting. But anyway, it was this kind of mosaic of independent film financing. But we got it together. Oh, Fred, the, the, that film, the, the beauty of the color in that film... I remember seeing the film. I wonder if anyone else experienced it. I remember seeing the film back then, and whenever ever I thought of the film, I thought of the lighting of that film. It's really, really uniquely beautiful. And you, you mentioned Fran, uh, Fanny and Alexandra. I don't remember it in that same way. It's a really unique. But my question is, in the middle of the, the singing, the camera wanders upstairs and looks at the figurines and history and the old ways. Where did uh, that was so unlike the rest of the film? Where did how did that improvisation happen? And there was actually more of that, um, which John uh, didn't use. Now, that, that it sort of, in a way, it illustrates the sort of sadness of her life, that's sort of what that was about. You know, pictures of people you don't know, crucifixes on a, on a Bible, etc. So I think we did a lot more with shots of a dollhouse, shots of many of other things I forgot. But no, that's what it was about, illustrating the kind of sadness of her life. Here. Yeah, um, there are a lot of close-ups in the scene. How did you get those? Did you zoom in with the camera, or did you stick the camera in the actors' faces? They just stuck it right in their faces. <laughs> no, no, there are no zoom lenses in this movie. Uh, so, so, it was, so, but it was shot with a steady cam, right? Did you use uh, a on occasion? It, it went it, a little of everything. It, mostly dollies, actually. The dancing and all was the steady cam, and the operator is a very good steady cam operator as well. He actually did Hoosiers with me, of all things, but uh, in the past, Randy. But uh, um, yeah, it was mostly dollies actually. Yeah. Or did we have? That no, was all dollies. I don't even think we had a small crane. Um, and steady cam for dancing and moving around and such like that. There was a question somewhere. No, right there. Up there. Sorry, it's dark in the back, so I don't see all the hands. One of the things that I found so beautiful and striking was that <clears throat> the film took the time. Every time there was a recitation or a piece of music or the older woman singing, we heard the whole thing. Nowadays, in American film, we would cut, you know, this tension spans have changed. 
It was so beautiful how we heard the whole thing all the time. Can you elaborate on that? Was that a part of the, the writing or the plan? Or? I think it was, it, it certainly was part of the writing. Writing, yeah. Uh, the writing and, uh, you know, to, uh, to create, you know, to create this intimacy where you almost felt like you were there with the, with the Morgan sisters. You almost feel like you're part of this family. And uh, it needed that time, and it also needed all this time to uh, to have these characters play out their role and play out their part. And uh, obviously, there's very little drama. You know, there are no fights, no big fights, and so it all was character driven. And uh, and uh, time uh, time was like part of the beauty of this story. This time flow. Do you know much about how Houston collaborated with his son Tony on on on, on the writing part? Uh, Houston did. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how they if they how much they worked together or how much it was, or if it was really just Tony doing it? Well, in the in the beginning uh, in the beginning it, it, again it was like part of John's idea of hiring the right people for the job, and Tony came to London and I think John worked with them for a few days. They worked through the stories and. John explained to Tony uh, how he saw the story and what he wanted to do, and then Tony was on his own, and he had to deliver it to his dad. Uh, no small feat, but uh, uh, I think I think that was a key part of John's involvement. So he let Tony work on it, and then he got a first draft of the screenplay, and then uh, they did a few revisions. But again, you know, John was also working on the screenplay with Tony, he was, you know, as incredibly economical, you know, he just wouldn't spend much time. He says, you got the job, you do the job. Uh, I don't know whether, it, how many people noticed that the f story takes place on the Epiphany, which is January 6th, yeah. and that is today. Yeah. So thank you, Julia, for making oh. that happen. <laughs> and I always want to mention, also, also want to mention today at the Irish Film Institute in Dublin, the film uh, the film was shown again. It's like an annual event, a big event actually in Dublin, every January six. Irish Film Institute shows. Speaking of Ireland, oh no, sorry, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, I just uh, wanted sorry. to. I remember Fred, you're telling me <clears throat> stories about that John was. Uh, was on oxygen, had an oxygen tank wherever he went, and that created some amusing or scary moments in the making of the film? Did I make that up? No, I mean, didn't not, not amusing, sometimes scary, because I was smoking a lot then. Yeah, but that, that's what I remember you telling no. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Fred with a cigarette next I'd to John to. on an oxygen tank. Yeah, right. <laughs> but we had we had the whole set wired with oxygen, with oxygen tubes, so he could move easily from one part of the set to the next part of the set, and uh, required some kind of oxygen management. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if Angelica was involved right from the beginning. Uh, yes. Yes. There, there is a luminosity of her performance. It's like it's like she has found something else in herself. It's really, it's really, uh, you know, every time the camera is on her, you, it just stops. Everything stops. Well, she, uh, Angelica, grew up in 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 Ireland on the west coast of Ireland. So, um, I think it uh, it touched something very deeply in her, and. Uh, it was, I think it was for her a very difficult role to play because there were so many uh, emotions involved with her life experience in the, in the west of Ireland. We never talked about it, but uh, I think that's where part of this performance really comes from. She, yeah, she, I think she said that the film was a tribute to their joint love for, for, for Ireland. At least that's what she, she, yeah. she saw it, yeah, that way, yeah. Yeah. There was someone here. I got it. Is uh, what did John Houston think of it? That he lived to see the f yeah. and the product. Yes, yes. Uh, we finished the film. We finished the film in uh, I think in in July, uh, in July of nineteen of eighty eight, and we showed him we showed him the finished film, 
in Los Angeles. We made the print and... And we made the print, showed him the film in Los Angeles. He went to the East Coast to work with his son on another film. And uh, we had we had planned the world premiere of the film at the Venice Film Festival. And then John died on uh, August, a month after we showed him the film, he died August 28th. And on the 3rd of September, 88, we had the world premiere uh, in Venice. Mm -hmm. And it was quite, quite an amazing experience. Um, I was in London, I flew to Rome, and I arrived in Rome at the airport and I walked by a newspaper stand and all the Italian newspapers had John Huston on the front page. And there was one particular photo where they only took a picture of his eyes across the whole page, front page. And underneath, all it said is, I think, El Morte or uh, El Morte. El Morto. El Morto. El Morto. He's Morto. dead. He's dead. And only the eyes. I mean, it was unbelievable mm -hmm. story. You know, I actually can't remember. I know we sat in the theater, made in the lab, made the print, looked at it, I think said something like very good. And then we got, I mean, I, I, he made no, I, I recall him making no comment about the way he said very good, I think. And we walked out and we we're walking across the lobby and um, said, you know, I have an idea, Fred, I have an idea for a movie, would you be interested? It's about grave robbing in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so for a change of obviously, tone, yeah. Obviously, he was the kind of person that once he was done, he was done. OK, yeah, he's been trying to. Yes, we'll give you the mic. I love the movie. I mean, it's fabulous. Uh, particular the uh, voice off camera singing is just a it was a spectacular to be so grooved for one scene with nothing except the music behind I thought was amazing uh, I'm curious what happened to it commercially and also you know today I, of course it's hard to raise money for anything but for independent an independent film like that uh, seems to me you know maybe maybe uh, a screener, you know, what's happening on uh, on Netflix equivalent it would, would make something possible. But uh, it would be very, very hard to get public appetite for that in a big screen uh, to come and see it. I'm just curious how it did commercially at that time. Well, I think um, there wasn't much more appetite for this kind of a story when we made the film. <laughs> You know, as we noticed, and it only was possible because of this, uh, because of the European financing that I was able to attach to attach to the film. Um, uh, so, I, mean, I don't know. Today, I'm not producing films anymore, but today, uh, I think if I really got interested in it in difficult material. Uh, where everybody would say, well, you can't do it and you can't find the money. I mean, there's always money sloshing around up there for movies, you know. It's, there's always great interest and uh, it's streamlined more at this point because of all the streaming services and the way they kind of corporatize the production and the development. Then they have the long-term kind of programming ideas and, uh, you know, engineering, engineering, according to you know the broad taste of the streaming audience, et cetera. But I think there are always enough cracks uh, in the system to get in. Commercially at that time. Sorry? Commercially, how did it, it do? It did actually very well. This, uh, this was uh, Vestron's second biggest grossing film after Dirty Dancing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a surprise, yeah. Uh, and uh, and the, film, the film did actually did well for us. Uh, it you know didn't make uh, millions, but it did very well. It recouped, recouped the cost of production, and then some. And uh, it has slowed down in the in the past few years. And uh, you know we have, have to get back in and kind of get a a digital a digital version made. Fred and I have been talking about this, and uh, it's kind of always playing somewhere in the world. And I just looked up the list. It's the film has been distributed in like 80 countries around the world. 
in practically you know every major language. And, and it was a, it was a huge critical success. You know, it had Academy Awards, and 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 so it, the film was 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 big. Last one. Yeah. Um, I too loved the movie. Um, I also remember reading the story a long time ago in college. And Joyce obviously is a musical writer. Music is important, and language has a musicality in in his dialogue and in his description. And I'm wondering, in the photographing of actors talking, was the rhythm and the musicality of their lines a critical component in whether a shot was deemed correct or whether um, it just was waited until, you know, the, the shot worked visually and it was accepted on that premise. Um, actually, we did very few takes in general. I mean, the minimal amount of takes, I would say. Um, no, it, it all that was somehow... I mean, first of all, one thing we didn't say is that John rehearsed the actors well ahead, did a long table read, went at least a week, as I, as I recall, um, in which he rehearsed it over and over and over and over. And plus, you had these wonderful Irish actors who spoke that way. <laughs> I mean, you know, that was simply, I think, and that's part of John's, as Chris said, that's part of John's thing. He it pays a great deal of attention to how he casts. And he lived in Ireland for a long time, so he knew, he knew this. You know, he knew the way that it should be spoken. And I, I think a part of it also was, you know, the, the casting process. So to get a completely Irish cast like this cast uh, required some effort. So uh, John couldn't travel. So Vila and my partner and I, we were doing, you know, the initial casting in, 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 in Ireland, in Dublin, in Galway, in London, in New York, in Los Angeles, in, uh, in uh, we looked around in Canada to get an Irish cast together that would work for John. And um, as you mentioned, the language and the, uh, you know, the, the originality of, of the language, of the dialect was a very important element for John to make his decision. He didn't want any fake Irish accent in the film. And, you know, we cast like hundreds of people and he looked at hundreds of videos uh, to make his decision. But it's a good observation. There was obviously um, part of his choice. And with this, we have to we have to finish here. Thank you so much for for coming. Thank you for coming.